right, I think we're ready to get started. So Mary Bell, on behalf of Coretta Scott King Young Women's Leadership Academy, I want to welcome you. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much for agreeing to meet with us today. Yeah, of course. We have two classes of girls here that are eager to talk with you. They've got some questions for you already, but I was just amazed and I saw that you were in the field of biochemistry. Yes. Genetics, I no less. And we've been having some um, various discussions around genetics yeah. and even the role of Henrietta Lacks cells being used nowadays. Yeah, that is right. I think it's absolutely amazing because I remember the first time that I um, came across who this person who Henrietta Lacks actually was. And that was certainly not um, early on in my studies, let alone um, high school. And um, so I absolutely love the fact that you're having this specific focus because we do need to talk about these kind of things. Yes, we do. We definitely do. Before we get going good, uh, maybe we can go around and introduce ourselves. I'm uh, Dr. Cheryl Jamison. I teach 11th and 9th grade English and support the Department of Exceptional Learners. I am Mrs. Moss. I teach both ninth grade lit and SAT prep. Have enjoyed the experience at CSK, enjoyed um, working with Dr. Jameson and excited about this opportunity that was opened up to both me and my girls. Thank you so much for the invitation. My name is Maribel. I am originally from Germany, from a really small town in the west of Germany, close to the Dutch border. And um, since a couple of years, I live in the United Kingdom in Oxford, where I'm doing a PhD in biochemistry. I think my entire you know, journey as a um, student of biology, of genetics, of biochemistry, has led me from Germany to the United States, to Canada, and then to the UK. And um, I've come across different fields, but I can certainly say that my area of passion is the biology of aging and all the age-related diseases that um, are connected to getting older, such as cancer. The biology of aging. Yeah. Okay. So Maribel gave us a little bit about what she does. Does anyone have any questions for our speaker today? What made you want to do biochemistry? I certainly didn't know that I wanted to become a biochemist, you know, um, since early on <laughs> in my childhood. Um, I actually wanted to, you know, do so many other things um, when I was younger, but then also when I went to um, middle school and high school. But I do know that throughout my childhood, I had my grandfather who was a doctor and he always, you know, he would always get his microscopes out that he had at home once he retired. And he would always, you know, show me these samples um, of different tissues. And I always thought it was pretty cool. And I think during middle school, when I was like, you know, probably between 12, 15, I always thought that I would do something with language, with um, politics, maybe. I was very interested in history. And so all the courses that I picked in school were mostly, you know, focused on those things. I was very much into Latin, um, which was a very, well, weird choice because, you know, no one speaks it anymore. So I don't know, but I, I, I somehow thought it was interesting. I guess nowadays I know that I really like the logic of it because uh, it's closer to maths really, rather than um, to another language. And when I got a little older, like 16, 17, I was lucky enough to have two teachers who really sparked some interest um, in me for chemistry, biology, and the natural sciences. And they, their classes, they were just cool. They were, I love to go to their classes. They would do experiments with us that were, those, those experiments were just great. They were interesting, you know, it was fun. I slightly started to shift my focus. And I think another reason why I wanted to shift away from, from you know, um, the humanities or, you know, languages and, and, and social sciences, I somehow, I was intrigued by the natural scientists, sciences, because I wasn't really, I wasn't good at it. I wasn't as good as, um, you know, my grades weren't as good. And I, I, I had a harder time following the teacher. And I thought, this is weird. I was always a really good student, but somehow there's a couple of, you know, classes and subjects, which are really hard. And for some reason, it didn't put me off it kind of, you know, it made it more interesting. I was like, okay, chemistry, it's so hard. It's physics, I really don't get it. And so I was like, 
I want it to get to know things better and I want it to become better at it. So for my final two years in high school, most of the classes I picked were the classes you would pick for a career in, in, in science. So I had chemistry, I had um, my specialization in biology and cell biology and maths. And um, I really got rid of all the languages and history and everything, which, you know, in hindsight, I kind of, you know, sometimes regret it. But I also admire that I was, you know, curious and brave to try something new. So I started doing science and I was intimidated because some of my classmates already went to university in the afternoons and, you know, were reading for chemistry, for example. And I, I, they were so much ahead of me. But you know, I, I couldn't really let go. So I, you know, I kept, you know, working on, on, on my understanding and my maths and everything. Um, and it was great. And I, I, I eventually became better at it. And back then I, I really thought I wanted to, to become a doctor and study medicine. That was, you know, at the end of my high school um, times. And then unfortunately in Germany, you know, you have to just like in the U S you have to be really good to get into med school. And I didn't make the, um, I didn't meet the requirements for med school. Um, and when I graduated from high school, I was 16, which is a little bit younger than, you know, the usual age. I, I already lived by myself. Um, so I had to support myself and I had to take care of myself. And I just couldn't meet the grades to enter med school. And so I thought, okay, what else could I do? What is closely related to learn about the, you know, molecular world, um, about diseases, about, you know, how humans work. And I thought, okay, I should probably try biology. And then I enrolled for a general biology program, an undergraduate degree, fairly close to where I was, you know, brought up, but I still had to move to a big city. And it was, um, again, you know, an intimidating decision, but I really wanted to learn about this stuff. So I said, I can do this um, and, and I can try. And, you know, it, it's funny because I don't think I really understood what, what studying general biology meant. And I, I didn't realize that I would have to do a lot of chemistry, a lot of physics, a lot of maths. Um, so I started studying and then, you know, I, I did my undergraduate degree. I started focusing on, you know, the biology of aging. Why do we age? How do we age? Um, cell biology. And then, you know, after three and a half years, my undergrad was already over. And I was like, wait, hold on. I, I don't even know about all the details of this. I, I, I barely got an overview. So there's no way I can stop right now. And I was lucky enough to, at that point, you know, I got a scholarship so I could also afford, because that's also a big question, how do you afford your studies? I had a scholarship that it allowed me to keep going, do a master's, master's degree in cell biology and genetics. And that was, that was just amazing because I finally got all the details that I'd always wanted to know. And, you know, I was in small classes with, a, with professors who would, you know, really pay attention and, um, and, and, and dedicate their time towards really giving us everything we wanted to know and to learn. And then halfway through my master's degree, I was like, this is amazing. And I kind of want to learn more about academia. So the, you know, the, the university system and, and how, you know, how to become a professor at the end of the day, honestly, that was the goal, how to become a professor, how to be the person to give the lectures, to inspire students and to do the critical research that we need as a society to, to tackle diseases. Obviously, the next step was going, was, was going to be um, enrolling for postgraduate studies and doing a PhD. And then I was really lucky and also working very hard to get into this really, really great place, Oxford, where I'm now in the UK to do my PhD. So coming back to your initial question after, you know, telling you a lot of stuff about the different stages in my studies, I think when... I did these microscopy sessions with my granddad. I saw cells for the first time. I saw things that you can't see with your eyes, but still they will dictate what your life's going to be like uh, in terms of health and disease. And I thought that was so fascinating thinking about the fact that most of the structures are smaller than what we can actually see with our own eyes. And most of the mechanisms are smaller than what we can even understand. And, you know, realizing that there's techniques and a way of researching all this made me, you know, want to become a biochemist and go down to this really atomic level of how do things actually work in our bodies. And that's why I wanted to be a biochemist. And that's why I'm still aspiring to be one. Thank you. I've 
want to make sure I heard this correctly. Did you say that you graduated from high school at 16 and you were living on your own? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. That is correct. So I was I was the clearly the youngest student at my high school. Um, not sure about the entire country. So usually in Germany, you would graduate graduate between 18 and 20. And that's when you move on to university. So um, it, it was hard. I moved out when I was 15, just a couple of months before turning 16. And I moved to a new city to be able to attend a girl's school, which is why I, you know, I know what it's like to go to a girl's only school and I would do it again. When I went to high school, I wasn't that much of a fan, but in hindsight, it was the best thing I could do because our teachers were prepared and ready to equip us girls with the kind of tools you need to succeed, not only in life, but also in science and technology. Unfortunately, boys and men do still have a little bit of an advantage there. And we do need, as girls, as women, we do need a special support. That's interesting. Thank you. You are on the call with quite a number of very determined young women. That's the best I can put it. They all have their own mind and don't mind speaking it. That's definitely, that's what you need in life. I mean, I mean, this week, International Women's Week, um, you know, I've also been looking into a lot of, you know, movies, but also, you know, Instagram content and, and, and you know, general information on on women in science and if you know if this week has again taught me one thing or reminded me of one thing although it's 2021 and there should be some equality not only for men and women not only gender equality um, but also equality for women of color in in science although things are progressing we aren't there yet and we cannot afford to think that we can't do it we have to dream big we have to be strong and so I'm, I'm very excited to hear that I'm talking to a group of determined young women who want to dream big and who believe, want to believe in themselves. Absolutely. Ladies, does someone else have another question for Maribel? Are you mixed? Yeah, so I actually have a, I don't know if you can, if you'll see it. Um, so that's my mom, my dad, myself with my doll when I was four. Um, so my mom's German and my mom's white and my father is Cuban from Havana and black and um, yeah growing up as a black or mixed girl in Germany is can be a particular experience because obviously in terms of like culture and the way I've been brought up um, my first language is German I think you know my character is very German I have a lot of you know the stereotypes for Germans I have them I have all of them Still, when I go to a seminar in Germany, when I go to university, no matter what I do, people will look at me and think, hmm, she doesn't look like all the other people in this room. So I think it's a, the, yeah, the particular challenge for me in Germany was that people, there's not a lot of Black or mixed people. And I was the only one in most of my courses. And there was one other mixed girl um, in my year who's one of my best friends. You, you're pretty much by yourself. You don't have a lot of role models that you can look up to, such as, you know, Black professors. For me, it was particularly challenging that I never felt like, okay, I'm fully belonging because in Germany, I'm, I'm a Black person. But certainly when I go to Cuba, I'm a very German and very European white person. It took me a long time until I thought I had, had somehow understood where I could, you know, place myself in the spectrum and feel a bit, you know, a bit more grounded. But um I just saw a very, very good movie today, which is called Picture a Scientist. Um, so if you get the chance to, to watch it or, um, or host a screening, I, I highly recommend it. You know, they have these statistics about in the States, approximately 2.2 of the employed. So yeah, employed scientists being Black women versus 25, yeah, roughly 25% white women and 47% white men. Of course, 2.2% black women, that's nowhere close to be representative for the entire society. And it's similar here in, in the UK and in Europe in general. And, and it's hard because you, you know, you really, it's, it's a struggle to find role models, to find mentors who you can talk to, can relate to your issues. My current supervisor is great, is a, is a great academic mentor, but he's a white guy. So, you know, he, when I, when I, when I showed up in the lab with like, you know, really long extensions for the first time and, and braided hair, 
the kind of looks I got, that was not nice. And, you know, it's happening everywhere. And I know that, you know, he's trying to just focus on signs and the professional parts, but, you know, I, there is microaggressions in my working environment. And, and, and so I think there's a quite a long way for us to go to, to make STEM and science and academia university a more inclusive environment and um it's it's definitely the best thing you can do is to find mentors and role models that can relate with the kind of struggles that you face particularly as a black woman in science thank you asada smith put a question in the chat she says in the lab what are you really good at <laughs> nice question in the lab, and whatever. Really I'm, I'm going to give you another one because it's related. Yeah. Uh, Tanasia also asked, "What has been your most challenging project, and what did you learn from it?" Yeah, in the lab, I am really good at doing a specific. So there's, I mean, there's different levels to this question. Right now, I'm thinking about a specific kind of essay that I do a lot um, during my PhD, and you know, in my lab, we joke that I'm, you know, and the the expert on this. And that's actually also what I like about doing a PhD in science and, and, and doing science in general. You will become an expert on a topic and on a certain technique. And that is so cool. I I don't know. It just gives me this like excited feeling when I do something in the lab and I know that I got it and that I know how to do it. And, you know, just walking around using protein biochemistry which means you know i'm looking at proteins the small machines and cells do a lot of protein purifications for that so i use cells to make protein and then from um the cells i need to purify the protein to get a really like pure sample and then use it for assays to understand what the proteins are doing and this machine um that we're using on a daily basis is easily sixty thousand. And just being able to use that machine and like knowing how to use it, knowing how to use the software makes me feel pretty badass, you know, especially because, you know, we get to hear it all the time, you know, from early on in my childhood. Yeah. You know, women, they can't handle, you know, machines. They are not good when with driving cars. I don't know. The stereotypes are endless. And unfortunately, you know, here, at least we have a ratio of 20 to 30 percent of women in science and engineering versus 70 to 80 percent men so these stereotypes are stuck in everybody's mind but I really like and I'm good at handling these machines and like being confident about what I'm doing doing my essays for my undergraduate for the part the last six months were a, 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 a one defined project where I would go to a lab every day um, and do research with them so it was their um, undergrad research assistant and you know we had defined aims for this project I thought you know it was the one of the first lab experiences that I had and I thought this is all you know this is well defined I understand I got it I'm going to do it and then it's going to work and I'm going to get my result and boom going to be the best undergraduate they've ever seen before, uh, in their entire you know existence and so I start working on this project and after six weeks and I was closely supervised by a senior scientist our head of the laboratory, the, the, the boss walks, walks up to me, a woman, a woman professor from Finland, actually, um, back then working in Germany, she walks up to me and she says, have you ever looked at your experimental setup? It doesn't make any sense because I was trying to grow cells um, and I was trying to find out what's, what particular nutrient stem cells need. So the cells that give rise to all um, other cells in, in specified tissues in our body. And um, they also play a big role in aging because stem cell exhaustion is one of the big hallmarks of aging. Um, so these, these stem, stem cells can't divide anymore. And then, you know, the tissues break down and, and aren't, aren't doing that great. And that's all part of the aging process. So I was trying to understand what kind of nutrients do these cells need? What's their food? What do they, you know, what do they need? And then we would use that to, to, to maintain these cells um, in plastic dishes to do experiments rather than in a mouse or another another living model. And, you know, she looked at me, she was like, this is crap because you're missing out on some basic nutrients that every cell biologist should know cells do need to survive. And we're talking about sugars and, you know, really basic stuff that everybody knows that we need to eat that. And I mean, cells are just humans on the mini, mini, mini scale. scale. So I felt very embarrassed and 
you know, it sometimes happened that you work on something and after a while you realize you are so focused on the subset, on the small thing that you were working on, that you lose track of the, you know, of the general biological principles that you should always have in the back of your head. And well, this is one particular example where I then realized that I would have to put in some sugars, otherwise my cells would never grow. I think it happens again and again throughout your, um, your, your training that you, you realize, wait, hold on. I am right now forgetting about one of the most crucial things that I learned during my first year of undergrad or maybe even back in high school. And those basic principles and like, remembering the the big picture but also the small details sometimes it's just you know it's a lot and 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 I think that's that's a challenge and that's that was back then and even nowadays um a struggle for me when I when I work on a particular project um that sometimes when things don't work I realize that you know there was something a bigger issue that I should have taken into consideration or I, I just lost, I just lost the, uh, forgot about, you know, the basics and you should never do that. <laughs> I think that's a lesson that can be taken almost into any area of life. Yeah. Don't get stuck so much on the small things that you forget the big picture. Yeah. Ms. Moss, there's some questions in the chat from your crew. Yes, my girls are, they are loading it up. Hold on one second. Yes, I'll make sure that I give shorter answers. And <laughs> no, no, rambling. you're fine. You're <laughs> fine. Um, we were just excited to have you. And so we prepared some questions. So let me go yeah. back. Um, did you ever want to change your career? Absolutely. <laughs> Multiple times. <laughs> um, my mom did go to university. Her parents didn't. She did go to university and she studied um, theology, became a pastor. So she's a woman of the church and into, you know, public speaking, into education, history, at the moment doing a PhD herself. I'm very proud of her that she, you know, after having children and, you know, all, all this time, she went back to university to, to finish and, you know, fulfill her lifelong dream of, of, of obtaining a, um, a doctoral degree. And my father is a musician classical Cuban salsa music. So he's playing conger, congas, those really long um, um, drums. Throughout my undergraduate degree, I would hear things like, well, but you used to be such a creative child. Are you sure science is the right thing for you to do? And my mom wants me to become a diplomat. So, you know, that's me, 20 years old, trying to wrap up my undergraduate degree and then, you know, to to understand and, and decide what to do next in life and my parents give me these you know put these little bugs in my ears it's not the right thing for me and I think one of the hardest you know if you have a close relationship to your parents one of the hardest things or any you know mentor or guardian um, during your childhood and, and teenage years the, one of the hardest things is to get these little bugs out of your ears and be like okay they do know me very well and and they probably only want the best for me but it there is a small chance that they don't know what I want and what interests me and what excites me. So, you know, finding the balance between drawing on their experience in life, but also finding your own voice, that was really hard for me. And, and that made me like second guess my choices all the time. Regrets, mostly in a sense that I used to dance um, and I still do. Um, and I used to dedicate a lot of my time apart from my studies to, to dancing. So I did a lot of like street, street dance and hip hop, but also then um, um, ballet, classical stuff and, 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 and modern jazz and, and those techniques. And, you know, I, I did everything started starting when I was, you know, 10, 12, 13, it was, went to a casting show. Cause I thought, you know, I really have to do something about this. Cause I, that's what I love. That's my passion. Um, and I kept doing it even throughout my undergrad, my master's, you know, I went, I went, I went to the, to the studio four times a week, two to three hours, because I always thought, okay, I'm going to do this degree, I'm going to finish this course, and then I'm going to go 
for an audition. I'm going to audition and then I'm going to dance and that's it. I'm going to become an artist, you know, and then my parents would put these by and be like, yeah, you should be an artist. You're so creative. You should, you know, don't be a scientist. <laughs> and, um, you know, they, 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 they didn't have any bad thoughts. They were just like, you know, it's something they can relate to. You know, my, my, my dad's a musician. My grandfather was a Cuban musician. It's something they can relate to. So, you know, they can't support me in science. They just want it to be, to be close, closer to home. So I understand, you know, it's not a bad intention there. And um, so I would always think, yeah, okay, one more degree. And then for sure, I'm going to audition. Up until today, so now I'm um, 24, I'm doing my PhD at, you know, what people say is one of the best universities in the world haven't auditioned yet I mean honestly if you want to um you can you can totally contact me in five years from now or any other time in between and we'll see maybe at that point I you know I'm gonna you know there will be a different career for me but I don't think so because every time I had to apply for a new program and applying for you know PhD for master's is a lot of work and studying is expensive every time I went through you know everything I made lists I thought about it really hard and I did decide to do science again and again and again and when it doesn't you know after a bad day in the lab um I do sometimes regret and you know sometimes I see things online or uh I I go and visit a, 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 and watch a show or I see people I used to compete with and you know now they're somewhere else dancing um I don't know the Super Bowl and I like, I wonder, oh, could that have been me? And, you know, that's, I don't know if that's regretting, but that's just wondering, like, could that have, could I, would I have been able to, you know, make a career from that as well? But I, I won't know. And I, I also don't think that, you know, I, I really strongly believe that because I made so many choices by myself with really without asking anyone else, you know, I didn't ask anyone, should I do a PhD? Should I pursue the career? I never asked. So I just went for it because I wanted to do it. And that gives me some confirmation that I am exactly where I'm supposed to be. Um, and also gives me some hope and confidence that if it ever wasn't the right thing for me to do, I would just say, stop, stop right here. No, nope, I'm going to pivot to something else. And so I'm not too concerned, but of course I do have doubts sometimes, yeah. Thank you. So it is okay to have doubts. Yeah. And it's very good to stay committed. Dr. Jameson, I can ask a few more questions because they keep, <laughs> they keep coming. Okay. Um, Why do I want to be a scientist? I think um, for me, one of the, you know, most like powerful things to me is being able to understand what's going on inside of my body, but also, you know, right now, COVID, being able to understand the disease, the vaccines, the impact is so good. Like it feels, it feels really empowering. Um, and, and being able to understand why things are the way they are. Um, you know, even you, you could also say, you know, science and being a scientist and developing the mind of a scientist will always help you even if you don't want to be a scientist for the entire for your entire life it will always help you to understand principles concepts mechanisms you know as a scientist it's not unlikely for scientists to go into um, different areas because they are so good at understanding complicated concepts and for me studying biology and now working in science is just a journey where I develop this really analytical mind that will always help me to understand problems and you know developing this problem solving mind that is why I want to do it because you know even if I one day I don't find molecular biology as interesting anymore I can just use my skills in a different um, um, area uh, and of expertise and then you know analyze the same kind of things which is you know also why don't be too afraid to go for a particular you know career choice because if you're good at it and if you learn the skills you will always be able to use it somewhere else 
and and yeah um but, but, but i'm gonna have a look at the chat to make sure i get all your questions my dream project ah <gasps> oh, wonderful question i mean i do really love the project i am working on right now at the moment i'm working on the regulation of inflammation so how our cells fight infection and pathogens upon injury for example of your skin um, and I, I'm looking into the molecular mechanisms that cells use to um, fight infection, um, which also plays a role in a lot of inflammation related diseases, which actually at the end of the day are almost all the diseases. Every um, cardiovascular disease, cancer, um, chronic inflammatory diseases, including arthritis, um, all connected to inflammation. So I feel pretty badass to be working in the inflammation field and understanding these very basic mechanisms. Um, but my dream project, my very first placement was in Seattle in um, Washington State and at the University Medical Center. And I was looking into fertility. And my dream would be to connect my research with my passion about promoting gender equality. Um, so ideally, and I think fertility, you know, is something where, where this plays a huge role. And so for me, it would be really cool to work on something, for example, a disease, a rare disease, but also a more common disease would also be interesting that affects women um, predominantly, you know, for example, arthritis, actually. So that's a, a very severe and painful inflammation of the joints. Some of you might might be familiar with it um, from, from family, family um, members. Um, predominantly it does affect women. So it's going into the right direction, but I mean, um, there's a couple of, you know, like really women specific, I would like to have a more feminist lens for my research, but I, I also understand it's kind of hard because I'm in science. So um, I think I'm just like in the middle of my, you know, awakening when it comes to how do I even think about my own projects because for a long time I've just been carrying out research that other people have designed and so I'm just like finding my own voice at the moment trying to you know to to think about what what could be interesting what should we look into more um, so I can't really give you a specific example um, but yeah that's definitely it do you work with other female scientists or males or both? We do work in super mixed teams. It's a coincidence that um, in this lab, so we call it lab, but you know, it's a research group um, within the Department of Biochemistry here in Oxford. We are at the moment only women graduate students and then our boss, who's a guy, <laughs> coincidentally. But um, I've, I've worked for women and, 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 and male professors alike. I was always conscious about, you know, who I would choose to be my supervisor because it will have an impact on your work and you know the way you will feel um, and the way you will be treated and um, unfortunately the higher so we call it the leaky pipeline so there's a lot of efforts at the moment to to get you know young women into STEM to get them into the field get them to do an undergraduate degree in, in science and technology maths engineering but then throughout the different levels of career bachelor's, master's, PhD, then we do a postdoctoral degree or uh, phase, and then tenure deployment, employment at a university, there's a decrease of, of you know, the amount of women. So like 50, 50 in the States, I know that 50% roughly in, in the STEM field are women at the, at the undergraduate degree, but then master's is like 45, PhD closer to 40 um, or completed PhDs. Um, postdoc, so that what comes after your PhD, um, 35, and then, you know, less than 30% actually employed. And then again, this number that I said earlier, mentioned earlier, you know, 2.2% like women really in the high levels in, in uh, universities and science. So I, whilst I do have a lot of um, women around me, when, when you're looking for a professor to supervise your work, to mentor your career, it's hard for me to find women and it's even harder, I, I wanna say impossible for me to find um, a black woman, um, let alone a German Cuban mixed 
woman, you know, so it's like, it's, it's, it's very specific, you know, what I'm looking for, but then, you know, I always give this example that in my first couple of months here in Oxford, in order to see an influential black woman speaking, I had to see a talk from an, from a leading economist and I have no clue about economy. I, I have the basic knowledge, you know, maybe that's not good, but you know, I had to go to this talk and I had to talk to this woman and come up with questions. She, she was um, a leading consultant in the UK and um, it made me feel uncomfortable. I wanted to talk to a black influential woman in science, but there was none. So I, I, I just went to, you know, the next influential um, uh, inspirational speaker. Um, but yeah, so in your, in your you know, day-to-day -day environment, um, there, the, the field is very mixed, but when it comes to higher positions, it's a male dominated, still a male dominated area. And we're working really hard to change that. Um, trying to, you know, get some women up in the university um, president offices and, and so on and so forth. <laughs> Okay. We have time for one more question um, before the ladies have to prepare to transition to a fourth period here. Yeah. Ms. Moss, I think that was your question, wasn't it? Yes, I think this is a great way to end the interview. Thank you so much, Mirabelle. You've been awesome. Um, where do you see yourself in the next five or 10 years? And then what's next for you after graduation? That's, that's such a good question. <laughs> um, and I do think I change my mind every two to three months, <laughs> pretty much based on how my experiments go. And if I've had a fight with my supervisors, <laughs> but, um, I still have this big dream of becoming a professor and I don't think I'm going to give up that easily, but as a matter of fact, I mean, the becoming a professor in science is just highly competitive in general. And this is, you know, independent from being a, a woman of color. It's just highly competitive and not everybody will make it. And it's not enough to be smart. It's not enough to be hardworking. You, you have to have luck. You have to have the right connections. It's a lot. So ideally I would move on to a postdoctoral position, you know, where I really work on my own project and, and build the basis for my independent researcher career. Um, but then at the same time, I'm also super keen on, you know, taking some time after my PhD and exploring other areas. As I said earlier, I am, I feel very confident about using this problem solving mind that I've developed in the past, um, seven years, um, to just take it to a different area and take it to a different context and apply it there and see what kind of problems I can solve there. Um, I've done, you know, a lot of teaching. I've done a lot of summer schools and, and I'm also like really into working with talented students and, and, you know, just giving them the kind of food they need. Cause I remember what it was like back then when someone gave me the attention, gave me the kind of information. Um, and I, I want to be that, you know, inspiration for other people. So I can totally imagine taking some time going into a different sector coming back to science you know you can you know can take a couple of years off um go back and forth um but yeah i mean we will see i think what is really important for me at the moment is that i've found a mentor um a um mid-career um, entrepreneur from india she used to be a scientist in the uk as well and she now founded her um a health personal health um um focused startup in India and she's a woman of color you know she can relate I call her and we talk about my problems we talk about my dreams we talk about the challenges she gives me some advice what I can practice what I can do and you know sometimes she just says take some time off go and plug your eyebrows do a nice hair mask and then you know breathe in breathe out and tomorrow is going to be another day and I found this mentor and I'm I am incredibly grateful and once again stressing the point really you need mentors you need support you need a system for you to be there maybe family friends or um other professionals that you vibe with and you feel like you can trust them um and i think with their help and with my own determination and some luck i am surely gonna get you know maybe to a professorship one day um and definitely to a job where i feel like i'm i'm home and i'm doing what i should do Thank you so much, Maribel. It has been an absolute pleasure you speaking welcome. with you today. 
Kyla, just come off mute and tell Maribel what you just said. Just tell her. Oh, okay. I, want to, I just said thank you for your time today. We enjoyed you so much. You learned so much. No, you're absolutely welcome. Yeah, I really hope you um, found it interesting and um, could get some insights into what it feels like and looks like to be a scientist. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And it's something to seven in the UK right now, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Time. We, we appreciate your time so much. Ladies, just thank Maribel for her time. I thank, thank you, you for giving up part of your class time to spend time with Maribel this afternoon. Yeah, absolutely so appreciate it. Thank we you. definitely, definitely appreciate it. Thank you. And I just want to say if anybody feels like they want to reach out to me, I've had um, contact with, um, I don't know, Nuriel. Nuriel, um, yes. And um, yeah, if someone wants to, um, maybe you can um, help with um, facilitating that um, happy, by, I think email would be the easiest um, for now. Um, okay. If someone wants to reach out, um, ask for advice or um, anything like more particular things that we didn't have the time to talk about today. Thank you so much, ladies. If, if you want to contact Maribel, if you would just reach out to me, um, I've got that contact with Nuriel and uh, we'll put you in touch. We, we hope to see you again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good luck. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>